fear of loneliness consumes the kid. Alan Klein became one of pop music's biggest business managers. He loved upsetting the suits. Had Klein planned to put his hands on Cook's fortune from the start? Call me crazy, but this sounds like real life Darth Vader to me. This is the story of a disadvantaged kid that made it big. The story of how he worked hard using his wits to get on top, to prove to himself that he was worth the love and success that his father didn't think he deserved. This is the story of Alan Klein, of his rise to success and of how he became one of Rock's biggest villains in the process. Hello, Top Patters. This is Simon Mas, a guy with a master in musicology and composition who likes a challenge. I won't just tell you a client's life story. I will do so using a five-act structure. Shakespeare. 18th of December, 1931. Newark, New Jersey. Alan Klein is born of Rose, housewife, and Philip, a butcher. Rose dies of cancer when Alan is nine months old. The rest of the family soon disintegrates. The loss of Rose and the ongoing depression means Philip has to close his butcher's shop. And without the shop, the clients can't pay rent anymore. Philip puts Alan and his youngest daughter in Newark's Hebrew orphanage and sheltering home. It's a lonely life. Philip visited the home only once in years. The clients reunite when Philip remarries, but even then, a sense of instability haunts Alan. Philip remains uncommunicative and distant, incapable of ever seeing any good in Alan. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Fear of loneliness consumes the kid, but he learns to read people exceptionally well giving them what they want and need becomes the key. That's the core of Alan Klein's life desire. Throughout his life, Alan used money just to keep the score. What was fundamental for him was getting the things he missed as a child. Companionship, validation, power over his own life, over people. He was never to be alone again. Nobody was gonna leave him. Alan was a quick learner. When he was 14 years old, he got a job at Essex County News. It was there he came in contact with several common business scams. The clerks created false accounts to cheat suppliers or issued padded receipts and made accounting mistakes to cheat the customers. In later years, Alan had a ball using that knowledge to uncover scams against his clients. But first, there was some more learning to do, thanks to the army. In the two years spent serving Uncle Sam, Klein made extensive use of the army library. And then, thanks to the GI Bill, Alan went to college. Accounting, a solid career that could lead to the success he craved. It was 1953. In just 10 years, Alan Klein became one of pop music's biggest business managers. It didn't come easy. 1957. Klein is traveling to Los Angeles for an audit of several record companies. His first important job at the Joseph Fenton and Company. Remember the tricks Alan learned? during his stint at Essex County News? He certainly did. Klein uncovers extensive underpayment to publishers, a shocking standard in the music business. Back to New York, Alan starts thinking. The publishers had the Harry Fox agency to look after their interests. He could create and chair a similar body for the composers. The Recording Artist Protective Association, or RAPA. Intriguing idea, but Klein abandons it. Why? Because of two key lessons and a big setback. 
first lesson. Klein audits epic records for rockabilly singer Ursula Hickey. Reading the contracts his client has signed, Alan discovers an inconvenient truth. After the initial advance from Epic, it is very unlikely that Ikki will ever see a penny. The distribution of the earning is unfair by design, and all of the expenses are charged to Ikki. Upon checking, Klein discovers that's another standard of the music business. The lesson for Klein was to negotiate better contracts at all costs. Second lesson. Courtesy of Maurice Levy, the owner of Roulette Records, one of the toughest players in the music business at the time. Klein discovers Levy owes money to two of his clients, singers Buddy Knox and Jimmy Bowen. Levy agrees to pay, spreading the payment over a four-year period. Unacceptable. Klein demands an immediate payment. Heavy shrugs. What's Klein gonna do? Sue him? Klein understands he has lost the negotiation. A trial would cost money and it was unlikely to yield better results than what Levy had already offered. The lesson here was that negotiation was the key. Screaming led nowhere when you didn't have the upper hand. What about the setback? Well, Klein was fired from Fenton & Company after just four months. He worked hard, but he couldn't stick to normal office hours, and employees can't make their own rules. The parting with Fenton was bitter. Fenton wrote the state of New Jersey to urge officials not to certify Allen as a public accountant. Allen never took the exam. Game over. 1963, five years from the birth of Alan Klein and company. You thought not getting a certification could have stopped him? Alan has hired other people for the nitty gritty. He concentrates on building his name and bringing the customers in. Klein has to promise and deliver more than other established business managers. A bit like those starting a new YouTube channel have to deliver more and better, but without having great guys like you that smash that subscribe button to show us some love. Oh, behave. Klein's customers are small fishes. Not enough to get on top, but enough to get his name around as the guy who puts the fear of God in record companies. That's a quote from R&B singer Lloyd Price, by the way. Alan must have felt a burning pleasure when he uncovered the label's dirty tricks. He loved upsetting the suits. It was great publicity. He loved proving he was smarter than those punks almost as much as he loved keeping his clients happy. One day, Alan receives a call from R&B DJ Joko Henderson. Henderson is one of the biggest radio personalities of the time. He airs an influential daily program in New York and Philadelphia, and he has a live show at the Apollo Theatre in New York, where he presents new and established performers to the public. Henderson intends to replicate the Apollo successes in Philadelphia. He approaches Klein to become his partner. Henderson will provide the talent and the showmanship. Klein will look after the business and organization side of the deals. Allen agrees immediately. The real value of this proposal for him was not his money share. It was the chance to meet and woo artists into Allen Klein and company. Indeed, it's through Henderson that he gets his first big break. Sam Cooke. In 1963, Sam Cooke is a great singer with some 30 top 40 R&B hits in six years. He has the looks and the charms to be one of the rare black artists of his day to cross over into white pop charts. But Cooke has a keen business acumen too. He understands contracts and royalties. He understands when he's taken for a ride. When Cook and Klein get talking, the singer mentions problems with his record company, RCA. 
For a start, he can get the label to return his calls and he's calling because the accounting looks wrong. Alan goes straight to the point. I think they're treating you like a nigger, and that's terrible. You shouldn't let them do it, says Klein. You're right, says Cook. I want you to go after them. And after them Klein went. This was a battle that Alan couldn't afford to lose. It was the battle that made him one of the biggest business managers in music, and one whose outcome had people talking for the first time about the dark shadows stretching over him. <laughs> Cook's problem was twofold. One, he was earning too little money for an artist of his caliber. He had signed substandard contracts at the start of his career, which led to two. Sam seemed stuck with RCA records and an array of publishers. Klein took action to sort out both problems. He restructured Sam's publishing deals. Cook immediately received $50,000 plus a guaranteed minimum of $29,000 for his songwriting royalties for the following two years. Cha -ching, cha -ching. After that, Klein looked into the recording deal. He discovered the existing RCA deal was about to expire. Alan decided to go talking with Columbia Records. And Columbia was listening until the management heard Klein's proposal. Sam Cooke wanted a 10% royalty. For simplicity's sake, let's say that amounts to 10% of the net earning of all the sales. Not only this was double the standard royalty for top white artists of the time, but the way recording contracts worked, raising the royalty standard for even one artist allowed every other artist on the label to ask for a renegotiation of their contract and to walk away to greener pastures if there was no agreement Columbia couldn't accept. Klein was nonplussed. Time to go back to RCA. That's when Klein's genius shone the brightest. Alan made sure RCA management knew he was talking with Columbia. Then, during their first meeting, Klein put the RCA management into a corner. RCA wasn't giving Cook the support he deserved. Was it because he was black? Then, when the meeting had just ended, Klein hit RCA the hardest with a great piece of theater. As he was strolling down the hall of the RCA building, Klein was called back into the meeting room. His lawyer had served RCA with papers for an audit on Cook's behalf, minutes after he had walked out of the room. Alan pretended to be shocked and surprised. He didn't know anything about it. He immediately made a big show of calling his lawyer right then and there. He told the lawyer off and then apologized for the terrible mistake. Of course there would be no audit. Not during a negotiation. The message arrived loud and clear. RCA had to compromise or else. When RCA suits and Klein met again, he made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Klein said Sam Cook was ready to start his own production company, Tracy Limited. Sam wrote and performed his material. He could now produce the sessions, record the music, and press the records himself. RCA's role was to act as a distributor of the record pressed by Tracy Limited, with a five-year exclusive. This meant less expenses and fuff for RCA. It also meant a lot of good for Cook. One, for the first time in music history, Cook had the chance to get back the ownership of his masters 30 years from the recording dates. Two, by manufacturing the disc through Tracy Limited, Cook had the chance to check the accounting more often. Three, being a distribution deal, RCA could give Tracy an increased royalty of 6% to pass on to Cook. RCA agreed. 
The company paid Tracy Limited an advance of $100,000 per year for three years. Two more optional years would cost RCA $75,000 per year. Oh, groovy, baby. Yeah. Thanks to his association with Alan Klein, Sam Cook had received his freedom back, plus more than half a million dollars for the next five years. That's more than five million dollars in 2023 money. How's that for promising and delivering? The deal had a number of other sweet aspects that I can't cover here without being too technical. Ask me with a comment if you care to know. There was only one problem. Taxes. Klein had one. His deal with RCA had made him one of the top music business managers in the world. Finding new customers was not going to be a problem anymore. But there was still a little problem for Cook. The IRS would eat a lot of that half a million Klein had provided if it was paid in cash. Once again, Klein had an idea. RCA could pay its advance to Tracy Limited in preferred stock. This had two advantages. One, no tax was due to the IRS until the stock was sold. Two, if Tracy Limited was set up as a holding company not owned by Cook, there would be further fiscal advantages. Cook agreed to the plan. Tracy Limited, a company named after his daughter to produce and press his records, would be set in Nevada and owned by Alan Klein. If you don't see any problem with that, here's a demonstration. Here's Sam's money in Klein's hands. Here's Sam's coming to get it. And this is what he got. Pennies. It's not like Cook wasn't paid, but when he died in December 1964, Alan Klein, owner of Tracy Limited, was free to use the money still unpaid to Cook as he pleased. He used it to buy the masters of Cook's old hits. Soon after, Cook's widow decided to sell him the rights of Cook's publishing. To be fair, Klein advised her not to do it, but she insisted, and Klein bought them. Had Klein planned to put his hands on Cook's fortune from the start, or was it just one of those things? People talked, and they still are. The fact is that months after Sam Cook had agreed to create Tracy Limited, he was dead and Alan Klein was the one on the receiving end of Cook's legacy. And as we will see, people talked a lot more as Klein continued his climb to the top of the music business world, becoming the business manager of two of the biggest bands of the 1960s, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. But let's leave the dark clouds gathering until the second episode of this trilogy. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love!